Morning guys, Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School. Out here to start another video series with you guys today. Um, what I wanted to do was I'm working on a lot of video series at the same time right now, so don't think I'm forgetting about things. We're going to keep on going with a lot of different series right now. I'm going to continue with the On the Water series, On the Water's Edge series, as soon as spring hits. Um, the blacksmithing series is still going. Trapping season is over now, so the trapping series is pretty much ended other than you know, you could trap for coyotes right now, and that's about it. And I may do a little bit of that later on down the line. I may not. We'll see. Um, the Cabin Fever series, still going strong. There'll be videos posted on that here in the next few days. I've got a lot of videos stored up that I post as I can as well. Um, started a series yesterday on camp cookery. That series will continue. We're going to talk about camp cooking throughout time different implements that they use for camp cooking and things of that nature we're going to talk about in that series. And I also wanted to start kind of a uh, response series, I guess, to my own videos of Discount Bushcraft. And this will be the bullet Bulletproof Bushcraft on a Budget series. It's going to be a response. The first budget bushcraft series that we did, we went out and bought items as cheap as we could find them to build a cheap bushcraft kit. With this series, what I want to do is I want to go out again. We, we went out over the last few years and found a lot of cheap items I should say inexpensive items doesn't necessarily make them cheap inexpensive items that I would consider bulletproof if I were going to put them in my bushcraft kit and I think that's what's important to understand is the difference between common man and common sense common man means I can afford it common sense means if I have to save a little bit and buy it because I know it's something I'm going to have for the rest of my life that's great if I can find it somewhere on the cheap at a rummage sale, a yard sale, a Salvation Army, a scrap yard, then that's even all the better. But if it's something I can't find but one place and I've got to save up to buy it because I know it's something I need, I know it's something bulletproof, then that's still common man. You know, don't mistake common man for common sense because there, you know, there's a difference there. Um, so what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about a bulletproof bushcraft kit on a budget. And we're going to start out and go through this series in the 10c order basically but we're going to go in depth with things that i've collected over time we're going to talk about prices we're talking about what they are things of that nature and we're going to start with cutting tools so i'm going to reposition this camera down onto a wool blanket here and we're going to talk about some different cutting tools that i would consider good options for a bulletproof kit on a budget and then we'll go through them one at a time stay with me guys okay guys so let's first discuss you know, the top of the food chain and cutting tools. Let's talk about axes, all right? I have two axes. I've shown both of these axes in another video, but they're worthy of being in this video because if I had to rely on my life to these axes, I would do it every day and twice on Sunday. Both of them were bought very inexpensively. The first one is a full-size felling type axe, probably a trooper or something like that if I had to guess. It's an older head. I bought this at a scrapyard. The head cost me probably with a bunch of other stuff, I'd have to guess right around three bucks. The handle costs around 12. So 15 bucks, I have a full size felling ax and there's no doubt I'd stake my life on this every day of the week, 15 bucks. I also have a double bit cruiser ax here and I paid $22 for the sheath for this ax just because I was too lazy to make one. Not that you couldn't make one. And this one is an American-made sheath. I got this off the internet. This is made in the USA right on it. And it was like $22 or $23. But it's a good heavy-duty cowhide leather sheath for a cruiser-type double bit axe. This one is a plum. It's got the plum logo on it right there. A double bit axe. I cut the handle off just a little bit to make it more comfortable in the hand. Sand the head down a little bit and sharpen it up. And let's talk real quick while we're on the axes because I would take this one the same way. I mean, I paid about the same amount for the head, about three bucks, about 12 bucks for the handle. So you're talking 15 bucks for that axe too. And I'd stake my life on that one every day of the week. Now, let's talk about double bit versus single bit axes for a minute. A double bit axe is a lot more dangerous to wield, obviously, than a single bit axe is. So you kind of have to watch what you're doing and know what you're doing if you're going to carry a double bit axe. Double bit axes didn't really become popular until the 19th century. And especially around the Civil War. And what they used double bit axes for, you know, is iconic with lumberjacking and things like that. But the main thing that was used 
that double bit axe were used for a lot throughout that time period where when they were clearing roadways and things like that with wagons and horses to drag the logs away, the Teamsters, which were the guys who would clear those roads, would carry an axe with them to fell trees and cut stumps out and cut roots out and things like that where the roads were going to go through. And they found that, you know, Obviously, when you're banging into the ground to get roots out, you're going to hit rocks, you're going to hit sharp objects, um, and things like that, and your axe is going to get dented up and beat up and chipped up, and you're going to be sharpening it all the time and refurbishing that face. So the double bit axe came in very handy for them because they could keep one axe at edge very keen for felling trees, and the other one would be used for the rough work the things where it might beat up your head a little bit. And then they would mark either one side of the handle or one side of the head in some form or fashion, or you'd have a big nick out of one side so you knew which one was which for the sharp side versus the actual hardworking side. So that was the big popularity of double bit axes in the 19th century was because of that type of work. Um, a regular axe like this, you know, this, not exactly this design, but this style axe has been around, you know, for a long, long time. They carried axes like this even in the 18th century that were very similar to this design for felling trees and things like that to build cabins with. Both of these are pretty big axes. They're both over 19 inches. I prefer a 19 inch hunter's axe for the woods or a 22 to 24 inch forest axe. This one pretty closely emulates that because I've cut the handle down to about 24 inches, but it is a double bit, so it's a little more dangerous to carry. So it's a tip for tat there, but either one of those axes, I'd bet my life on every day of the week. All right, 15 bucks. I'd pay that for an axe I like to stake my life on any day of the week. Saws, all right, bow saw. I've shown this in another video. It's just got a piece of rubber hose cut to protect the blade and protect it from cutting into my pack and things like that or my hand when I'm grabbing it out. Um, these things are cheap, guys. Don't waste your time carrying just the blade so that you can make a buck saw or some kind of handy fashion bow saw in the woods out of, out of a wood sapling. The frame doesn't weigh anything. It's tubular metal and it doesn't weigh a lot. The whole saw costs about $10. You might as well just carry the whole thing. Yes, you can roll this blade up and it will take less room, but if you've got any backpack of any size at all, you can shove this thing right down behind you in the frame or in the front behind whatever you've got in there and you're not going to notice it's there and the weight is not that substantial as far as the frame goes compared to the blade to give up that bulletproof handle just so I can say, oh, well, I'm just going to carry this blade and roll it up in a tin or whatever the case may be or carry it in a tube and make my own saw in the woods. If I'm going to use a saw, it's not because I want to have to go make a saw. It's because I want to pull it out of my pack and use it for a saw. Ten bucks bulletproof no question about it okay now that doesn't leave you with a smaller saw necessarily to do fine tasks with like carving notches and things like that you can do things like buying just raw saw blades and pinch them into a pair of vice grips that's a very good common man way to do things um, what I came up with for that is and I've showed this in another video as well but at a sale I picked up a piece of early 1900s history here, and I keep it in a tin, and it's basically a folding pocket knife that was made in Germany, and on that knife, there is an attachment point on the front, and this was one of the early period, what you call multi-tools, and it has, I've got a piece of brain tan over it, it has several tools that fit that thing, including a small saw. So I can put that small saw on there if I want to do some work and lock it on. And then I can do some of my smaller carving tasks, notching and things like that with that small saw. And then it has the option of other blades on it as well. It has a file, it has a gouge, um, it has a screwdriver, it has an awl. It has what looks to be probably some type of a hoof picking implement of some sort um, if you were on horseback, things like that. But this thing only cost me a quarter. Now, are you going to find that kind of a deal every day? Probably not. But there are other options that you can have for a small saw that are pretty bulletproof, yet commonly man-priced. I would rather carry just a blade and a pair of vice grips as far as one of those sawzall blades and a pair of vice grips any day of the week than go out and buy a Gerber saw from Walmart or wherever the case may be for 10 or 11 bucks that I know for sure that handle is going to break as soon as I put it under stress. I've seen it happen too many times in my classes. So I want that saw to be as bulletproof as possible. This one is bulletproof. Sticking a blade in a pair of vice grips and cranking it down, pretty bulletproof. Um, 
those are the things that I would do if I were on a budget. Those are the things that I would look for. And you can see in this tin, I've just got a small ferrocerium rod wrapped in duct tape. I don't need that fancy stacked leather handle if I can wrap it in duct tape because that gives me a handle to hold on to. Plus, I can use this duct tape if I peel it off as a fire extender because this stuff is flammable. And I'm not really showing you guys the fire kit that I carry right now or that I'm going to talk about in the discount series or the bulletproof bushcraft series, but it's in there. So I just figured somebody would ask if I didn't say what it was. Somebody would say, well, what is the deal with that ferro rod? So that's just my redundant ferro rod. I believe that any redundancies that you have in your kit should fall within the first 10 C's. If they don't, then you're probably wasting your time carrying them. And then I just put a small rubber band around that thing and shove it in a tin to keep it protected. And that tin costs like a dollar at a flea market. Okay, very cheap and easy way to carry saws. So now let's talk about one more tool real quick. Talk a little bit about vice grips. I didn't show vice grips, but in the discount bushcraft series, I did show how to clamp a saw blade into a pair of vice grips. One of the things that Horace Kephart wrote about in his book was he talked about carrying a pair of side cut pliers. So why would these things come in handy? Well, if you got a set of good vice grips, they're probably not going to come in real handy. But this whole setup right here costs three bucks, sheath and the pliers, three bucks from a flea market. That gives me the ability to, number one, hold on to things if I need to. Number two, to twist and bend metal if I need to. I have a pair of side cuts on here so I can cut fencing and wire and things like that to manipulate and make things with. So for what they cost and what they'll do for me, it's a good option to throw in my kit with my cutting tools as just an extra redundant option in cutting tools that gives me a way to have a third hand in that pair of pliers by just wrapping something around those pliers to keep them shut. Um, so let's talk about the ultimate question now and let's talk about knives. I'm only going to show you guys three knives in this series. Remember we're talking about bulletproof bushcraft on a budget so we want to stay as cheap as we can, as common man as we can, with as much common sense as we can so that our knives all meet the criteria that we want them to meet. Now, for my main fixed blade, and I'm talking about the one knife that I have on my hip, all right, two knives I have here. One of them is a butcher knife that I picked up at a sale for three bucks. This one is a hand forged butcher knife of some kind. I have no idea when it was made. It's got brass pins, probably walnut handles. It works really, really good, holds a really sharp edge throw sparks off the spine with the rock, rips a ferro rod like you would not believe. In fact, my instructors call this the butcher wand because it can do so much. But that's a very good option if you can find something like that for three bucks. This is going to be an uncommon find. But let's talk about common, okay? This is a seven inch old hickory butcher knife. Brand new, $11. Brand new, $11. Full tang, 90 degree spine, not coated, 1095, high carbon steel. It will throw sparks off the spine with a rock. It will scrape a ferro rod very nicely because it has a 90 degree spine. It's not coated. It's very, very sharp. It's very durable. You can find these things in flea markets that are 40 years old that are still very much usable, very cheap, ch cheaper than $11 for sure. But you can buy a brand spanking new one for 11 bucks. Then you just got to have somebody make a sheath. And this sheath was made by the Amish. It was traded to me by one of my Pathfinder helpers, and I think he said he paid 10 bucks to have that sheath made. So for $21, I got an absolute bulletproof bushcraft knife. Now, if I'm going to have a redundancy in my kit, a backup knife, a smaller knife maybe that I'm going to use for carving and things like that, of course I have the pocket knife that I can use, but there's nothing wrong with a Mora. You know, an SL1 or SL2 like this one here has served me well for a long, long period of time. I've had this one here way since the beginning. You can see me wearing this on my neck in videos from clear back to 2008. Um, so I've had this knife for a very, very long time. It's still razor sharp. I've skinned a lot of animals with this thing. This sheath came from a bargain bin box at a gun show for like a dollar. Just needs a piece of leather cord put through it for a neck sheath, but it fits that more just perfect. 
a brand new Mora like this is about 11 to $15. So again, you know, it's a very good backup knife. That's not very expensive, but it does a lot of the things that you want it to do. The only thing it doesn't meet as far as the criteria of the Pathfinder system for a knife is, it's not full tang, it's a rat tail tang. Whereas this one's full tang and this one's full tang. So if these are my main knives and this is just my backup that I'm gonna use for fine carving, skinning, gutting fish, things like that, there's nothing wrong with having that thing non-full tang. So, cutting tools, let's talk about it. If I'm choosing for my kit, let's just say I wanna stay on the safe side and I'm gonna go with the bigger ax. More weight, but rate versus weight, this thing's gonna cut down anything in the woods, no doubt about it. 15 bucks. Bow saw, 10 bucks. Now we're up to 25. Probably not gonna be able to get this pocket knife. We all know that. Um, that was a once in a lifetime find. So let's say you've got another 10 bucks and a pair of vice grips and a couple of saw blades. So now you're up to 10, 15, I'm sorry, 15, 20. So you're up to 25. So if you pay 10 bucks more for the blades and a multi-tool to have a small carving blade if you want to, then you're up to about 35 bucks. Another $12 for this brand new, plus the sheath is another 20. So I'm still right at 50 bucks at this point, 50, 55 bucks. Good backup knife, less than 60 bucks. I got every cutting tool I need. They're bulletproof, they're not going anywhere. There's no doubt in my mind if I add three bucks more to that, I get a pair of pliers with side cut options on them. Still under 65 bucks, and I got a bulletproof system of cutting tools right here. That's what I would call a bulletproof bushcraft kit on a budget. $65, and there's no doubt I would trust my life to these tools every single day of the week. I'd carry these tools without shame. That's what I'm talking about by common man. It didn't cost me a lot of money. I searched hard to find them, but at the same time, they're bomb proof. It's not common man because I only paid two bucks for it. It's common man because I paid two bucks for it and it'll last forever. You know, like this ax. It's not common man because it was 15 bucks. A Wetterling's ax that costs 100 bucks is no better than this, as far as I'm concerned. So this is what I would call common man. I searched for it, I found it, I cleaned it up, I had to grind it off, clean the whole thing up, put a brand new handle in it, but 15 bucks, I got a $100 ax. That's common man, okay? So that's gonna start our series on the bomb-proof bushcraft kit on a budget. We're gonna go from cutting tools into combustion, then we're going to go into containers and cooking, we're going to go into cover, and then finally we'll talk about cordage and we'll move on from there. Okay guys, well, I'm Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School and I appreciate you joining me for another video out here at the Pathfinder School. I thank you for your views, I thank you for your support, I thank you for everything that you do for me, for my school, for my family, for all my Pathfinder affiliates and friends, and we'll be back with another video as soon as we can. Thanks guys.